Praise God. Amen. Praise God. It's a privilege to be invited to the Prescott Conference. It's very humbling to be asked to preach on Thursday night. Amen. Let's give God praise right now. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your grace and for the blood of Jesus, Lord God. We thank you for the miracle of the grace of God. Oh, thank God, thank God. Amen. What a tremendous grace on this conference. Amen. Let's turn to Proverbs chapter 27. We'll believe God to help us tonight and anticipate all that God is going to do. You can turn these monitors almost all the way down. Praise God. Proverbs chapter 27. I, I read a very interesting account about a father of a very wealthy family took his son on a trip to the country with the express purpose of showing his son how poor people live. The boy would spend a couple of days and nights on a farm with what would be considered a very poor family. And on the return trip afterwards, the father asked his son, how was the trip? And his son said, great, Dad. And the father said, did you see how poor people live? And the son said, oh, yes. And the father said, so tell me, son, what did you learn? The son said, well, I learned we only have one dog and they have four. <laughs> our swimming pool reaches to the middle of our yard, but they have a great river to swim in that has no end. We have lanterns to light our garden. But they have unlimited stars at night like I have never seen. The view from our patio only reaches to the front yard, but their view stretches as far as the eye can see. I learned that we have a small piece of land to live on, and they have huge fields that go on forever. We have to buy our food, but they get to grow theirs for free. We have walls around our property to protect us, but they have lots of friends around them to protect them. The boy's father was speechless. And then his son added, Dad, thanks for showing me how poor we really are. <laughs> the Word of God challenges the prevailing view of money and wealth. And I want to look at that because I believe there's great help for us tonight on World Evangelism Night. I've called this sermon True Wealth and World Evangelism. Proverbs 27. Let's read verse 23 through 27 of chapter 27. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. For riches are not forever, nor does a crown, or nor does the crown endure to all generations. When the hay is removed and the tender grass shows itself and the herbs of the mountains are gathered in, the lambs will provide your clothing and the goats the price of the field. You shall have enough goat's milk for your food and for the food of your household and the nourishment of your maidservants. True wealth and world evangelism. I want to look first of all at the need for diligence. One of the challenges people have in experiencing true wealth is actually the amount of effort it takes to manage it. As simple as this may sound, many people are never really blessed because they are not willing to be diligent with what they have been entrusted with. My assistant pastor, Chris Plummer, is a master in the realm of finances and helping uh, people to understand uh, how to manage their finances and, and, and to get a hold of finances that are out of control. And he's, he's, he's powerfully helped numbers of the couples in our church that were struggling. And he actually teach, taught a, um, uh, a, an adult Bible hour or a, a Sunday school and he uses this verse 23 as a beginning point. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks. One translation of this says, Know the state of your flocks and put your heart into caring for your herds. Now, this literally means diligent to know. That means put full effort into complete knowledge. 
the state of your flocks is speaking of the nature of your assets or your income. So for the average individual here tonight, let's just, let's just break this down. It, it looks like a calculator. And starting with a calculator, you do your sums. And you work out the income and the outgo. Is there anything left over? It's very simple. As Pastor Olson is famous for saying, if your outgo exceeds your income, then your upkeep will be your downfall. You should write that down. That's genius. If your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall. So it begins with that. It begins with whatever level God has chosen to allow you to be at, that you begin to know the state of your flocks, and you begin to make decisions about the house you live in and the car you drive, the clothes you wear, the food you eat. And it's all in the context of the state of your flocks. It's called a budget. It is not a four-letter word. And it's amazing how many people don't take the time or effort to work it out or having worked it out to make it work. Simply, how much do you make versus how much are you willing to owe? And, and every pastor that's, that cares about people in their church has become painfully aware that many, many people just don't have a handle on this. Are you aware of manageable versus unmanageable debt? I pastored uh, an individual in one of my many churches that you'll never guess. <laughs> and this person came to me and said, Pastor, I got a new car. And it wasn't a brand new car, but for them it was a new, newish car. I said, really? That's really good. And we had been you know, studying finances. How much, does, how much did it cost you? She says, it's $189 a month. I said, no, how much did it cost you? It's $189 a month, Pastor. How long do you have to pay on that? I don't know. <laughs> what, what is the interest rate? What do you mean? What are the terms? And, and it was absolutely like blank. And, and I said, listen, uh, we, you know, I, I began to help her and and I realized she has been taken to the cleaners. I said, you need to go to that car dealer, drop the car off, throw the keys in the front seat, and take a bus home. Because you've been ripped off. But it's, how many pastors know what I'm talking about? And how many people have no idea? Do you know the interest on your credit card? Did you know your credit card has interest? <laughs> Do you know the fees on your accounts? Do you have a savings? Do you have investments? Are you aware of the return? And do you know what that means? So for the individual to know the state of your flocks, it is, it is something that has to, be, has to be looked at. And yes, this is connected to world evangelism. For the pastor, it all also would involve a calculator as well as a plan and some disciplines and faithfulness. Pastor, have you gotten past the monthly hand-to-mouth crisis of ministry year after year? Have you learned to set aside for the tithe and for the rent? Have you learned to put something aside for world evangelism? Have you ever been able to develop a savings account if you're working, Pastor? Do you have an exit strategy? Do you have an exit strategy from secular employment to full-time ministry? Have you adjusted your lifestyle? You know, I've, I've known pastors, and God love them, that many of them have gotten past this. I'm not taking pot shots at anybody, but I, I've worked with pastors that were not even aware of the terms of the lease on their building. And some being aware would still ignore and lose the building by not renewing the lease. Run up credit cards by faith. <laughs> but somehow lack the faith to generate the money necessary to pay it off every month. And you know, all of this becomes a barrier to the ability of the church 
in world evangelism. It can affect the effort of world evangelism. And that is the strategy of the devil. In our text, the illustration is of a landowner with fields and herds and the need to know what you have and how they're doing. One, sa one translation says, when it comes to your sheep, you need to know them by their faces. That, that's strange. I have no file for that. But that, that used to be the way wealth was measured by the fields and the, and the flocks. And, and so you need to know them by their faces. You know, have you ever seen sheep? I mean, you look at them, the lights are on, but there's nobody home, man. It's like, and yet the Bible compares sheep to us. And the Bible says about Christ, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And, and it is said that in this culture, the shepherds would name their sheep and they would know their sheep by name. This is, this is talking about a diligence. So pastor, disciple, are you personally acquainted with the finances that you are called to steward? Or is it just garbage in and garbage out? And one commentator even said that this is instruction to those who have done well in life and delegate their wealth for others to look after. And they're counseling even those that have been successful to stay involved. Husbands, it is okay to allow your wife to manage the books at home. Many, many wives are much better at this than the husbands. But the question is, are you leading? Are you, are you the head of the home and are you aware of the finances? Do you have a plan? Pastor, it's okay to delegate the administration dynamics of the church, but I, I believe pastors ought to at least know how to do a monthly report. And how many pastors are clueless when it comes to basic financial principles? And, and, and the more... The more you plant churches, the more you become aware or, or even stunned. Can I say at the financial illiteracy of men who claim to be called to preach, unable to complete a monthly report on time? Really? And ultimately wreck the church finances? We've started a new proverb in Australia, and that is that if you are not smart enough to do a monthly report, you're not smart enough to be a pastor. Sorry. Small hard drive, less RAM, that's fine. You can find something else to do. God will help you. But if you, if you are not smart enough to do a monthly report, then you're probably disqualified. Can any leaders say amen with me and help me here? And really, it's not, it's not a gray matter issue. It's a character issue. That's really what it boils down to. This is not the inability to do the sums. This is character. And this is really where the rubber meets the road that... If we're going to reach the world for Jesus Christ, there is a character development that is necessary that we all need to attain to and humble ourselves before God. Because in our text, God's desire is to prosper His people. And He commands that there be a need and a diligence to know. I want to look secondly then at tr a transcendent dimension. Pastor Mitchell preached Monday night and touched on this masterful sermon, powerful anointing. And I got a fresh uh, reminder of this reality when I uh, listened to and taught the distinctives of our fellowship that Pastor Mitchell recently did in the Prescott Church. And one of the lessons in that distinctive series is the dynamic of financial transcendence. That's one of our that, that's a heritage privilege. If you're a pastor in this fellowship, there is a dynamic that has been released in this fellowship, and that is a transcendent dimension to finances. And the idea is that God's economy, economy is above the world's economy, and that we must tap into this to reach the world. And now the difficulty is most of us have been raised in a government-regulated fiat currency economy. And, and honestly, most of us are not even aware that there is any other kind of economy or any other kind of wealth. But in our text, 
It makes the comparison between the limited fiat currency and the financial transcendent economy of God. Look at verse 24. King, the New King James says, For riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. King James actually has the second part of this as a question. It says, For riches are not forever, or does the crown endure to all generations? It's a rhetorical question. And the answer is obviously no. So the, what does that mean? The crown, what, what does that mean? It does not last to every generation. And it's actually contrasting two types of wealth, two perspectives, two views of wealth. The crown is very interesting. You can study this yourself in commentators they ponder this. They, they ask, is the crown a coin? Could it be like what has been called a sovereign or a crown? Is, is, is an actual the name of a coin? Or is the crown actually the king that happens to be in power that often influences the economy? And, and in reality, it's either and both because they hold the same idea. It is one form or one view of wealth, and that is coined money that is sanctioned by the government. This is known as fiat currency, and this is the type of economy that you and I have lived under our entire lives, a fiat currency. It literally means legal tender whose value is backed by the government that issued it. It's paper. It's monopoly money. Hello, I don't care how many Benjamins you have in your pocket. It's just ink on paper, man. And this is a fiat currency. The history of this, from my reading, comes from Sardis, one of the seven churches that we read about in Revelations, which is now, uh, which is Turkey, actually. And Sardis had a wealthy leader named Croesus, and it is said that he was the first to mint coins whose face value was guaranteed by the government. Most or many societies followed this. The U.S. dollar was once backed by gold, but it is no longer backed by gold. So what is it backed by? When you have the greenbacks, as it were, U.S. currency, what is that backed by? It's not backed by gold. It is literally backed by the promise of future taxes. It is fiat currency. And the text says, does the crown last to every generation? And the answer is, of course it doesn't. Because these types of economies don't last. Historically, they have not lasted. Lasted. We all read about Germany in the early 1920s, hyperinflation due to borrowing for war and printing more money. Can anybody say QE123? And money became worthless until we've all heard about the wheelbarrows filled with these German banknotes that were used to buy a loaf of bread. Because these type of currencies, they don't last. I remember the first time I went to Indonesia for our missionary. Uh, the guy who does our books, um, he saves certain currencies that come in the offering and then he'll give me you know, certain money for a nation when I'm going here. Pastor, here is some Indonesian currency. And so, okay, good, I you know, put that in my wallet and I found myself in you know, the airport in Bali, I think, you know, and I'm, I'm on my way to Jakarta, I'm a little bit hungry, so I'm going to take some of this Indonesian currency, and I smell chicken, the universal food, you know, and I, I went to the, the chicken counter, and I got my chicken, and I went up to the cash register and pulled out my Indonesian currency, and she says, oh, I'm sorry, this money has expired. <laughs> so I beg your pardon? Uh, this money has expired. I said, you're joking, right? She wasn't joking. I said, what, what is this, some kind of a, like a 
uh, you know, a Kohl's coupon or something? What do you, this is a, what do you mean it's expired? There's no use by date on here. And I guess it had expired. I guess some, you know, decade before I decided to grace their border, some dictator decided that money was no good and put in some new money and, and sure, sure enough, well, conveniently, right next door to the chicken uh, stand was the money exchangers. So for my credit card, I could buy some new Indonesian dollars. I'm convinced they were related. I said, wait a minute. Wait, wait a... You know, this has happened in Hungary, Zimbabwe. And there's nothing saying this can't happen in the Western nations. And you can look up quantitative easing. You can look at the debts that are mounting. This is called printing monopoly money. In our text, there's a contrast to another form of wealth, which is actually the wealth God ordained in the earth. And it's the power of the field. It's the power of the flock. And the ability to re reproduce tradable assets. And this is how wealth originated before they began to coin silver and gold and move to fiat currency. This is linked to the creative forces of God. This is something vital that God has placed in creation. This has everything to do with what Pastor Mitchell talks about, the financial transcendence of God's economy that we have tapped into as a fellowship. God has ordained to bless and oversee the flock and the field. If you read verse 25 and 26, it describes the field is sown for hay. It is eventually harvested and traded or sold. The sheep and the goats can graze on the stalks and the fresh grass that grows after that the wool from the lambs provide clothing and further income. The goats provide money from milk to pay for the mortgage on the property itself. And here we have this dimension of God, and he's contrasting. He says, does the crown last forever? No. But what lasts forever is God's economy. And there's a dimension that we can tap into. That's not, that, so that does not mean that we need all to quit our jobs and buy a farm. What is saying that true wealth comes from us exchanging our weak fiat monopoly money currency for the creative dimension of God's economy. Financial seed. And the application all through the Word of God is very clear. As God's people... When we steward the wealth that we've been given, when we look diligently at the state of our flocks and our field, when we will take what it is that has been given to us, whether it's a one-talent income, a two-talent income, a five-talent income, wherever you are, if you will handle that in faith and obedience and discipline, our liberality then turns crown money into seed. Amen. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap also sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Verse 10 through 12, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your own righteousness. Paul is commending the saints at Corinth. He's telling them that because of your financial stewardship, because of your liberality, because you have been willing to take what God's given you, steward this, and begin to release this into world evangelism, then he is reminding you that you are going to release a transcendent, creative, powerful, miracle dimension of God's economy that is limitless. 
which means that we need to pay attention and leave room to honor God. No matter where you're at, if you have 12 people, or if you have 1,200 people, look well to the state of your flocks. Look well to what God's given you. Learn to participate. Learn to, to focus this because there's a dimension that I believe God wants every one of us to experience this. And when you do that and you leave room to honor God with tithes, with offerings, with sowing to world evangelism, immediately God's economy kicks in. And it is supernatural. It is superior to the world's economy. That's why God could pick Prescott, Arizona for a worldwide movement. Where there were not many people and fewer jobs. And very little money in the world view. But yet a people who began to understand this truth and began to steward what it was that God allowed them to do and allowed them to hold and begin to release that as a miracle seed, God began to cause an overwhelming harvest. And this is one of the keys to experiencing true wealth is the willingness to exchange the temporary fiat currency for the multiplying seed of true wealth it transcends the math. Listen, I know two plus two equals four. I need five. I'm already behind. How can I possibly participate? But I want to tell you with God, 10 minus three could equal 10 million because his economy is supernatural. It's a transcendent dimension. I'm going to close them with the promised provision. Let's read verse 26 and 27 said, the lambs will provide your clothing and the goats the price of the field. You shall have enough goat's milk for your food, for the food of your household and the nourishment of your maid servants. The combination of your diligence and effort plus God's multiplying power, you will have enough for all your needs and enough for all financial obligations and some left over to bless others. I loved... Pastor Campbell's illustration when that individual in one of our churches who has tapped into God's economy not only through the giving of fiat currency but he, he now raises produce and God is demonstrating what an illustration way more than he needs for his family way more than he needs even to give back into his church. And now he is exporting this all over America. Huge truckloads of fruit and blessing and abundance. I want to tell you that that is an illustration of what God can do for every family, for every church, for every city, for every nation on the face of the earth. Because it's the, it's the, it's the nature of the God that we serve. 2 Corinthians again. Chapter 9, verse 8 and 9, translation says, And God is able to give you more than you need, so that you will always have all you need for yourselves and more than enough for every good cause. He will always make you rich enough to be generous at all times, so that many will thank God for your gifts, which they receive from us. As a result of Pastor Plummer's labors, and, and, and again, I have over the years often taught and often helped couples but, but my brother has a particular gift. He's tremendous in his ability to sit with couples and his willingness and patience to do that. I want to tell you, the testimonies in Perth have been exhilarating. Couples that were tens of thousands of dollars in debt for many, many years beginning to look diligently to the state of their flocks, begin to have a plan, adjust their lifestyle to pay off the debt, and then the miracle kicks in. And then God begins to help them, and, and, and many of them are testifying how they've gotten out of debt, uh, all in the context of paying their tithes, giving to world evangelism, and getting out of debt, and now being able to buy a house, uh, being able to see themselves as pastors and missionaries. I want to tell you, I have seen this work in Kenya. I've seen this work in Australia, in the United States, when Chris Hart got saved. He was $90,000 in debt to the U.S. tax man. That was 27 years ago. And made a decision to adjust life. 
and still participate in tithes and offerings and it took some time and God did some things in his character but then the miracles kicked in it was it was powerful to watch and at the end of the day we sent him out and he had three mobile homes given to him like within a couple of weeks one for him to live in one for the church and one because it used to belong to the church and we might as well give it back to the potter's house it was a miracle of God it's it is it is a powerful dimension how many of you appreciate this choir from Chin Lee? <laughs> Hallelujah. What a miracle. What a miracle of God. I've had the privilege of, 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 of watching Chin Lee grow. From one, early on when Artie was, was there long, he invited me to preach. We were in this little, little structure. I wouldn't even call it a house. It was just this old, broken down excuse for a structure. And I was up against the back wall and there was just maybe 75 people packed into that little place. And, and from there, watching him outreach and disciple men and build a building and make it bigger and plant churches and give offerings and gallop. He just told me uh, the other morning that, that uh, God has powerfully enlarged the church, pushing 300 people. Finances on the reservation able to support their pastor, able to plant churches. I'm telling you, that's what we're looking at right here. He told me, Pastor Mitchell challenged him. He says, there's only one thing you lack, Artie. And Artie said, I'm glad it's only one thing. <laughs> he was happy. He said, you need a missionary that you support. I just got, had the privilege of being in China with a couple from the Chinle Church, fully supported. That is a miracle. That is a miracle. And that's, that's exactly what this, this, this text is saying. And, and Pastor Artie was telling me that they've turned a corner. When they did that, when they, when they took that challenge and, and began to do that, something happened again in their finances. And he said, like, for the first time, that church is running with, with some surplus because you have to have a surplus with missionaries. He's running with a margin. It's not hand-to-mouth anymore. And his missionary can call him with a need, and he can meet that need. Because I want to tell you, we serve the God of more than enough. Because we have to. Can you say amen? If that can happen in Kenya, if that can happen in Chin Li, that can happen in every church that's represented here. And this dimension becomes a mindset and a lifestyle. And it releases miracle provision. I want to close with a story Bob Burris reminded me of. In 1988, he went to Uganda. And if you remember Uganda in those days, it was rough. It was a rough country, torn by war and, and violation and AIDS. And he was in the store before he went, buying some supplies, and he saw some 25-pound bags of taffy. And he felt a nudge to buy some and he thought hey children like candy I'll buy some candy for the kids in Africa so he grabs a 25 pound bag of taffy and he starts to leave and he gets this feeling ah, I'll just buy another one that's almost the whole suitcase so he flies to Kampala gets into a vehicle with the team that he's leading he has to drive 200 miles out into the bush as we say in Australia to a remote village Five miles out of Kampala, he comes on a log roadblock. That's always a bad deal. And no sooner do they stop, out of the bush come boys between the age of 8 and 14 years old, armed to the teeth, AK-47s. He looked over to the left or right and saw some, one of these young boys was behind a 30 caliber machine gun on a tripod pointed right at them. He said he looked at these, these boys in the eye and he saw death. They were like zombies. And as the leader of the team, he has to do something. He's thinking, oh no. So not knowing what to do, he got out. He's walking around the back of the vehicle and he had a thought. I got candy. Imagine. So he grabs a bunch of this candy and walks up to these boys 
and begins to give them a handful of candy each. He said the result was miraculous. <laughs> These kids began to smile. Life came into their eyes. They began to eat the candy. They dropped their guns. They're running around like boys. <laughs> they drove on. It was a miracle. And on the journey between Kampala to the village, there were 17 of those roadblocks with the same greeting and the same result. And when he got to the village that he was preached to preach at, he was totally out of candy. <laughs> Did the crusade and 7,000 people came to Christ. And on the way home, no problems at all. God's creative power is linked to our giving. It releases true wealth for world evangelism. I'd like every head bowed and every eye closed. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.